President John F. Kennedy was smart and good-looking. But he was also quick on his feet and very funny, especially at press conferences. Mr. President, your brother Ted recently on television said that after seeing the cares of office on you that he wasn't sure he'd ever be interested in being the president. I wonder if you could tell us whether, if you had it to do over again, you would uh, work for the presidency and whether you can recommend the job to others. Uh, Well, the answer is... uh... The first is yes, and the second is no. I don't recommend it to others. <laughs> At least for a while. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more... The huddled people. masses yearning to breathe Consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi everyone, welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 27 in which we mark the 100th birthday of John F. Kennedy this month by taking a close look at the legacy and memory of the 35th president. We are coming to you this week from the Camelot Studios, located on the campus of Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, and Twitter, and Instagram. Leading us, as always, is our executive producer, Lulu Spencer who, for the past few months, has been ably assisted by our associate producer, Devin McHugh. And Devin joins me in the studio now. Hi, Devin. How's it going? Hi, O.D. It's going great. So what's up? It's finals week. I've been studying all morning, so being in the studio is a good break from that. Sounds good. And how many uh, exams and papers do you have? I have two exams, a final presentation in my drawing class, and a final essay due tonight. Sounds good. Eventually, it'll all come to an end. And I'm, of course, on the receiving end of not those particular assignments, but many others. So finals week has that same wearying effect on everybody here at the college. So you've been with us all semester. How have you liked working at In the Past Lane? It's been really great. I've learned so much, not just about history and the topics on our episodes, but also how to edit audio and how to create a schedule and sort of work through the problems of the podcast and our ideas for the future. So it's been really educational. That's great. And you've been great with <laughs> helping me get organized, which is not an easy, easy task. <laughs> and so what are your plans for the summer? You I mean, you're really interested in digital media. That's your major here. And what are you going to I know you've got something lined up for the summer that's related to that and also into the fall. So tell us about that. Sure. So I really want to work in music. And this summer, I have a really great opportunity to work for Bill Siddons, who's a manager out in L.A. So I'll be moving across the country, living with my sister in Glendale and hopefully learning about the music industry and having some firsthand experience with that. Sounds great. Bill Siddons is, he's quite a household name with a long history, so that should be fantastic. Well, we're going to miss you here, but we have work to do. So what's going on this week at In the Past Lane? Well, the main feature is your interview with historian Michael Hogan about his new book, The Afterlife of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a biography. Well, Devin, you edited this interview, and I don't know how much you knew about JFK before you did. So do you have any sort of impression? I mean, you're 20 years old, so you're several generations removed from the days of John F. Kennedy. Any thoughts about JFK? Like, what does it mean to people your age? Sure. Well, to me, before this interview, he was the same type of public figure in my head as I think he is for my entire generation, which is that he was a really good president whose legacy was ended too early, tragically. But there wasn't or hasn't been a lot of specifics in my education about JFK. And I think that's because your generation and generations above mine sort of think a lot of his legacy is already famously ingrained in the minds of America. And to me, the biggest part about JFK that I knew is that you know, he's the first Irish Catholic American president, and that was really special, especially to me and my family who are Irish Catholics. And, and from New England. And from New England, so he definitely was well regarded in my family. But other than that, it wasn't until actually this year when I also saw the movie Jackie, which you mentioned in your interview, that I learned there was a lot of deep specifics and details about his life and his legacy that I wasn't aware of. 
Yeah, it's a fascinating story, and I, I still haven't seen that movie yet, but based on what uh, Michael Hogan said and what you said and my daughter said, I better go see it as soon as I submit my grades. So that's, that's my plan. So what's our second feature for this episode? It's a short piece that you recorded at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas. That's the museum dedicated to telling the story of the JFK assassination. All right. Well, Devin, thanks for a great semester. You've been a huge help with the podcast, doing everything from editing to planning out future episodes to getting me organized, which, as we mentioned, is not an easy task. And you also had a chance to work with our executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Um, What was that like? Well, Professor, it's been an interesting experience. Many people find it that way. And, Professor, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to work on your podcast. You've been really great. You've taught me a lot, and it's been a lot of fun. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to tracking your career as you head off into the digital media world. Okay, people, put on a pair of those cool sunglasses that JFK and Jackie used to wear. Your journey in the past lane begins now. Every couple of years, we read of a poll of historians or political scientists that asks them to rank the presidents of the United States from best to worst. These surveys generally attract a lot of public attention, and they do so for two reasons. First, lots of people want to know where recent presidents rank. And second, many people want to know who's in the top ten. They want to see if Lincoln ranks number one versus Washington, but they also seem keenly interested in the ranking of presidents like John F. Kennedy. JFK often lands in the top 10. In fact, in a recent CNN poll of historians, Kennedy came in at number 8. Now, this result makes sense for some people, but it often leaves historians and political scientists scratching their heads. Kennedy, after all, served less than one full term. And he had his share of personal flaws and political failures. Well, there's no simple answer to this question of why Kennedy ends up often in the top 10. But part of this answer is certainly tied to the way that JFK created a magnetic political persona on his way to becoming president, and then, following his assassination, the way Kennedy loyalists carefully crafted and preserved a certain kind of historical image of JFK. Here to tell us more about this fascinating story is historian Michael J. Hogan. He is a distinguished professor of history at the University of Illinois Springfield and an emeritus professor of history at Ohio State University. He is the author of many works focused on the American presidency, and American foreign affairs, including A Cross of Iron, Harry S. Truman and the Origins of the National Security State, 1945 to 1954, and The Marshall Plan, America, Britain, and the Reconstruction of Western Europe, 1947 to 1952. Michael's latest book is The Afterlife of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a biography. Michael J. Hogan, welcome to In the Past Lane. Thanks, Ed. I'm glad to be here. I'd like to begin with the title of your book. The title at first glance seems to suggest that it's a regular biography of JFK, but it's called The Afterlife of JFK, A Biography. And clearly the focus, you say right at the beginning, is really not his presidency and his earlier life. It's really the life after his life. And that's kind of an interesting thought that you could write a biography of a memory. Is that really essentially what you're trying to do? That's exactly right. But I did worry a little bit that people wouldn't grasp its meaning. But it seems to have worked all right with you, Ed, so I'm, I'm back to being happy with it. <laughs> it's fascinating because the life of a person, particularly somebody so prominent as JFK, has many dimensions and many chapters. And JFK's afterlife isn't just a singular idea of who he was that you know, we capture in the fall of 1963. It really lives on and, and it's shaped by all the people that survived him. So that's a really fascinating look at this character that we, I, I think Americans just for whatever reason, can't seem to get enough of. And I guess maybe we'll find out more when we dive into this. So one of the things I was interested in looking at is JFK, his shaping of his persona really begins before his election. I mean, you could go all the way back to, you know, way his father got his exploits in PT-109 prominently published and all of that. So his image is in the making long before he takes office in the White House. But really, once they get in the White House, that becomes your principal focus, because there's a lot going on in those 1,000 days that are very carefully constructed and really sort of lay out the groundwork for what we remember about John F. Kennedy and the the way we remember it. So what's key about that time in the White House and the way that he and his wife Jacqueline approached the presidency and the persona of the presidency? Well, I think you're absolutely right that 
Kennedy, of course, grew up in a kind of media-made family, you might say. His father had been in Hollywood in the movies and so on. He was one of the first people in the United States to actually use, make home movies, for example. And I always featured his kids. And so I think at some level, JFK grew up comfortable around the media. He also grew up in a media age. This is the beginning of the time when television started to play a very important role in uh, American politics. Kennedy understood that, as did his father. And so from the moment of his beginning of his public life, his father was very anxious to shape his son's media image, to create a popular image, what I, would, what I call in the book a brand, a Kennedy brand, that represents him and all his best attributes and presents it then to the public. After he enters the White House, Kennedy and his wife, for the most part, not only inherit that brand, they begin to embellish it at every turn, uh, to show it in their public and to conceal from the public, as you suggested in your introduction. Anything, any attribute of personality that was at odds with the brand. We're used, by the way, to thinking this way about politicians today. After all, we have a president these days who claims to have been a master of branding. Right. And probably was. But in the 1960s, it was something of a new phenomena in American politics to create and sustain and polish an image a style. It was called at the time the Kennedy style, and I call it the Kennedy brand. It was enormously popular. It's a good thing you mentioned the polls. It's hard to believe that, especially these days, we have a president now has about a 39, 40% approval rating. But Kennedy, at uh, almost all through his presidency, three years, had a sustained approval rating at or above 70%, a high of 85%. So how he branded himself and how he presented himself was no doubt enormously popular with the American people. And then that popular image got fixed in American memory with his assassination. And after that, it was up to Jacqueline Kennedy and the Kennedy family to sustain the image in the years up until her death in 1994, but even up till today. So what are the things, you identify a number of things, I guess, beginning with Jackie's overseeing of the remodeling of the White House. And that's not just some, you know, not just getting a few contractors in there to do a little repainting and and such. This is a really carefully constructed project and one that reflects her ideals and her ideals of what she wants the public to think about herself and John F. Kennedy as well. What's in that remodeling that we should know about? The first thing I guess I would mention is that she restored the White House. It's often said that it was restored to its historical accuracy. That's not exactly the case. She sort of blended historical artifacts with her own sense of personal taste and style. And she did sort of create a sort of illusion of what life was like in the White House. Not life behind the scenes, but life on the stage. And in fact, in that chapter of the book, I borrow pretty heavily from new work on performance studies to talk about the White House as, in effect, a stage that she and her husband created for the performance of his presidency. And it started out as a plan to make the whole White House look something like it did when Monroe or Madison were presidents, but it ended up pushing into the early 20th century and looking more French and European, like a grand European palace, than it did necessarily American. And that helped her and him capture the notion that the United States now was, in fact, a grand imperial power. And her husband... The president was at the center of this, the leader of the free world. So it created an image, not just of the president and first lady or an image of the White House, but an image of what America had become in the world and how that image projected worldwide. And it also created a justification for American world leadership as not just a great military power or economic power, but as a great cultural leader in world affairs and therefore deserving of its position as a world leader. And this was enormously successful. People don't remember this, but Jackie actually won an Emmy for her performance in the video version of her famous White House tour. Right. The culmination of the remodeling was a walkthrough with a network television camera crew where she sort of narrated the whole, not only just the details, but also pushing that image. This is restoration back to a an earlier time. And that garnered a huge TV audience. And as you say, an Emmy Award is pretty remarkable. It is. And she also produced the first White House guidebook. 
which became an, a bestseller and generated enough money to help sustain the renovation for quite a long time thereafter. And she did win an Emmy, and the audience for that, I believe, was one of the largest television audiences of its time for any television show. Hey, what do you say we hit the pause button on this interview for a moment? Let's listen to Emmy Award-winning Jacqueline Kennedy do her thing as she leads an ABC News reporter on a televised tour around the White House. Mrs. Kennedy, I want to thank you for letting us uh, visit your official home. Every first lady and every administration since President Madison's time has made changes, greater or smaller, in the White House. Before we look at any of the changes you've made, what's your basic plan? Well, I really don't have one because I think this house will always grow and should. It just seemed to me such a shame when we came here to find hardly anything of the past in the house, hardly anything before 1902. I know when we went to Columbia, the presidential palace there has all the history of that country in it, where Simon Bolivar was, every piece of furniture in it has some link with the past. I thought the White House should be like that. It's a very entertaining, interesting video to watch. And the other thing that that is also in that video is Jacqueline's clothing. And that's another thing you highlight, that every outfit she chooses when she's on the public stage, both within the White House and then also abroad, is really carefully chosen to convey particular messages of sophistication, of understanding, of being young. All of these attributes are really carefully presented by Jacqueline. She seems to be a master at that. And, And in most cases, these choices really work. Oh, they work very well. It's a lot of work, apparently, when you read my book. You'll see it can be an awful lot of work to be the First Lady of the United States. And she was famous for her style or wardrobe, but it was no accident. Around the White House, when she had no public functions, she could all usually be seen in her riding gear or in blue jeans or in slacks with a casual sweater and so on. But when she had a public function to perform... She dressed to the nines, as they say, and that was enormously appealing. That became the Jackie look, as they say. Right. It was a very careful blending of sort of European high fashion with an almost relaxed American touch. So, and the same is true in some ways of the White House restoration. It blended European and American themes, imperial themes with democratic things. Right. And she was very interested in achieving that kind of a of a balance and succeeded uh, remarkably during her time in the White House. Yeah, both she and her husband convey this look of sophistication, but also sort of not too much that it's putting them beyond the reach of the people. So it does have that kind of highbrow and democratic blend, which they seem to pull off perfectly. Absolutely. And, but it was no accident. She often designed her own clothes. When she made a famous trip to her very first trip abroad, which was to Canada, she basically selected the color of the outfit she would wear and made made sure that it blended very nicely with the jackets worn by the Royal Mounted Guard, Canadian Mounted Guard. Mm -hmm. And when she went to Paris, she selected colors for her outfits that blended with the colors embedded in the French flag. All this to pay tribute to those who were hosting her, but also, in a sense, to display her own talent for high style and for an American as well as a European look. And another dimension of this you know, this brief residency in the White House, A Thousand Days, were the great events that they put on. So you describe the renovation of the White House as sort of creating a stage and them as performers, but nowhere is this more apparent than when at state dinners or when they would invite a famous musician or a poet someone into the house, into the White House for a special event. These were very carefully orchestrated events as well, also designed to convey a particular idea about the Kennedys and the America that they represented. Tell us more about that. No detail was too small for her to ignore. She managed and micromanaged everything, the menu selections, the flower selections, everything. And, of course, these events were famous. Like we were on television every time. It's like his news conferences. He had his own style, very, very relaxed at a news conference. Right. Concealed the fact that he overprepared for every single one of them. But she did too, of course. She was very careful in staging these events 
again, you'll see in her entertainments this blend of American and European high fashion and style. You could have Shakespearean performance in the first hour of entertainment, followed by a Broadway show tunes in the second hour of entertainment. So she always was, some part of it was always relaxed, and some part of it seemed formal, some part seemed very American, down to earth, some part of it seemed very sophisticated, cosmopolitan, and even European. And Kennedy became very famous for these kinds of events, and they were calculated always. I think I try to make the point in here that her fashion, in a, in a sense, as well as everything else, was an act of diplomacy. And these weren't just events that were designed to be fun events for those being entertained or those watching the entertainment. She and he had goals in mind, diplomatic goals in mind, and political goals in mind, and the way they presented things. For example, they made individual, I don't know if they still do this, I doubt it, but they, made, they used to make individual works of art for every one of their major guests and present them. So they didn't go down to Woolworths or right. or to the big department store. They actually created individualized works of art that were designed to please and flatter their guests. Yeah, so they didn't get a standard White House coffee mug. No, you didn't get that. That's what I got when <laughs> I was there, but that's... <laughs> and plus a handful of White House right. napkins. Yeah, I still have those. Or here, let me give you one example, because I don't think people realize we are so used to seeing Air Force One. But Air Force One didn't exist before Kennedy. They commissioned the first jet-powered presidential aircraft. And they designed the interior of the aircraft. They selected the exterior paints for the aircraft. And the aircraft was supposed to give a message about America. This was a powerful nation, a strong nation, but also in its sheer style and simplicity, the aircraft was designed to convey a sense that it represented artistic as well as economic and military power. As always, a blend of, of messages, you know, sophistication, high technology, but also simplicity and democracy. That's exactly right. Yep. Well, obviously, the next key moment in this presidency it comes to an abrupt end in November 1963. And you sort of divide that part of the story into two parts. One is sort of looking at the ways in which the immediate aftermath, how people reacted with grief and sorrow, but also idealization, which in some ways is natural. But you also track where the, some of the core elements of Kennedy memory and the Kennedy, the, you know, the attributes that people are going to focus on really start to emerge. Can you tell us more about how people began to articulate that? Well, this is kind of the jumping off point. When I started this book, this is sort of where I started. I was originally just going to do a little book on the funeral, which is one of the most poignant and dramatic events of, I think, the 20th century as a whole. But then I began, I was so impressed with the way people reacted. Of course, I lived through it. I was a teenager at the time, and I lived through the event, so I can, I remember experiencing it directly in my own household, which was full of Irish Catholics and very big Kennedy supporters, as you might imagine. Right. But the reaction was astronomical. I mean, it, it was so powerful. It was such a dramatic moment, such a cause, such a widespread cultural trauma, not only in the United States, but in Europe and around, around the world generally, that it sort of burned into the American mind and the American memory and the image of Kennedy as people had it at the time. So I became curious as to what made this guy so popular with the American people. What were his attributes, his aspects of character that stuck in American memory at the time and ever since then? And for that, of course, there's an awful lot of literature because people wrote by the thousands, wrote condolence letters to Jackie Kennedy. They're available at the Kennedy Library. Dear Abby, the columnist, asked people to send her their memories of Kennedy and where they were and what they were doing at the time of his death. It's striking that 35 years later, People could recall every single detail of the day in which Kennedy was assassinated. Yep. They just didn't lose it, and they still don't. Right. It is incredible. In fact, it's such a vivid memory that people who, like I was born just after the assassination, but I can, I can recite my parents' versions of where they were and as though I was there. I mean, they've told the, they didn't tell the story endlessly, but enough where I, I got the distinct details of, of where they were and how they were shocked and how the nation was paralyzed. And then I've heard other people say, yes, I was sitting in such and such school and Sister Mary Martin 
came in the classroom crying and we were told we were dismissed and that the president was dead. You know, it was very, very detailed. And I remember I was wearing a red dress, you know, I mean, these very, very detailed memories. Yeah. And I was a junior in, or a sophomore in college and I was about to start my Latin class. I took Latin in college. And when the professor came in and gave us the news, so I, like everybody else who was alive at the time and of a certain age, you just don't forget it. And that's key to Kennedy's long-term memory. What they remembered about him, actually, and they described it in great detail, you know, how handsome he was, his incredible, unmatchable charm, his wit and his inspirational rhetorical skills, a whole list of these what I call very personal attributes that then get wedded to a, what I call a set of attributes of character rather than personality, such as his heroism in the Second World War, for example, his willingness to stand up to the Soviets, his strength, the fact that he dealt with all these physical problems that he had all of his life without complaint at all, and so on. They put these two things together, and they form a well-rounded picture of how people saw Kennedy. Of course, this was partly a byproduct of the effort he and his wife made to present a brand or represent themselves in exactly the same way. So when he dies, what people already thought of Kennedy and what Kennedy, this sort of constructed image, the image that Kennedy and his wife had constructed of themselves as president and first lady, then get buried because of the trauma of the assassination, buried deeper and deeper and almost permanently in the American mind. And it's sustained today because the Kennedy family and Jacqueline Kennedy in particular until 1994 when she passed away, did everything they could to protect and preserve that that memory, that image or brand, that Kennedy brand they had, they had constructed for themselves in the first place. Right. And part of that was not only to elevate certain ideas, but to suppress other ideas too, the, yeah. the negative yeah. things that, that eventually come out. And before we get to that, is there any th- single thing that stands out from the funeral, from the meticulous planning of the funeral that, you know, the, like you said, it was really the original inspiration for the book? And I have certain images in my mind. I think everybody has the image of young John saluting as his father goes by. But what else is in that that spectacle that's noteworthy, where we really see the hand of Jackie at work, in the, even in the midst of her grief, in trying to still work that image for the next stage of its, of its existence? Well, of course, there's several iconic moments. And if you really look at them closely on film, you get the kind of feeling that she knew what she was doing when she, for example, when she knelt before the coffin and put her hand on the American flag to say goodbye to her husband, or when she prompts her son to deliver that salute to his father. And, uh, of course, then no one will forget when she bent forward and lit the eternal flame. It's remarkable, the whole list of them, and nobody forgot a single one of them. Right. People would burst into tears when they saw this, you know. So I saw the movie Jackie recently. I don't know if you've seen it. I was going to ask you about that. I haven't seen it, but uh, somehow I was not aware of it. But one of my daughters, who's a big film fan, said, oh, you've got to see this because it really delves into how Jacqueline Kennedy took the control over the legacy of her husband almost immediately and really worked hard to do it. So I was going to ask you what you thought of it, because it seems like the timing of that movie in your book is really uh, interesting. And I wondered how much you think the movie got right. There are scenes in the movie where she's talking to Bobby. And of course, there's no record of those conversations. You don't know what they really say. But Right. Generally, I would say it's very accurate historically. I was taken back by the performances were masterful. The music is haunting. Mm-hmm. I would really recommend it to just about anybody. And to me, of course, probably the most important thing about the movie is how it perpetuates the Kennedy brand. <laughs> yes, it's a movie about the brand and itself serves the brand. And of course, this is the movies are part of what I call in the book the heritage industry. Not my phrase, I was I've used it. Right. But Kennedy's brand, his image and style was so popular, people wanted to commercialize it, trying to make money off his brand. And they've been doing that ever since then. And these days, when not a lot of people take detailed history courses and so on, we get our history out of television, out of the movies. They mediate between history and memory. Mm -hmm. And the heritage industry always had a vested interest in perpetuating the Kennedy brand. The Kennedy brand continues to hold sway. Why Kennedy remains very popular is that in the movies he's never really died he's just right he's just always there and it's always a very favorable it's very rare to find a kennedy movie or television documentary that isn't 
favorable to John F. Kennedy. Right. Very rare. So not surprising that people who never read history or weren't alive at the time when history was being made think of those movies and think that is really Kennedy, though it may not be. He's frozen in time as this really good looking guy in his in his forties, sort of at the prime of his of his life. He's never gonna get old. Yeah. And of course we're approaching the hundredth anniversary of his birth, so the heritage industry. Oh, absolutely. And I guess I guess your publisher had an eye towards when this when your book would come out as well. I did. <laughs> yep, and there's I think Douglas Brinkley has another book coming out soon, so there'll be more and then there'll be this sort of usual things like the colorful thick magazines that you'll see at the checkout counter put out by Time Life. Yep. That are I haven't seen them yet, but I'm sure that they're they're already there or they're coming. No, they are already there. I, I just saw one from a People magazine. Right. So one thing I wanted to ask you about was Jacqueline engages in the aftermath of the funeral and all this long project to preserve the memory and to fend off critics and to favor people who you know the early biographers like Schlesinger and Sorensen. They do a good job of of really capturing this and perpetuating this golden boy image of of Kennedy. Right. But in the 70s, that's the age of Watergate, disillusionment, credibility gap, and eventually plummeting public confidence in government. And JFK comes under a lot of new scrutiny for being, in some ways, maybe mediocre as a president, maybe, you know, overrated because of his brand, and also maybe one who was timid, you know, didn't do much on things like civil rights, for example. That must have shaken things up for Jacqueline Kennedy and this effort that she was putting forward. Oh, yes. And of course, she she didn't tolerate it very well either. They were devoted to the Kennedy brand as Kennedy had constructed it when he was in the White House, and they'd always tried to perpetuate it through many of the monuments to his memory, and especially, I think, the Kennedy grave site in Arlington. They were guardians of the gate of history, as I say. Their job was to protect the image of Kennedy as they wanted people to remember him and not as he was portrayed or described in some of the revisionist literature of the 70s and 80s. That literature made a dent. I mean, they, they, they did describe him, as you suggest, as more conservative than liberal. Even conservative writers and politicians want to take credit for him. Yeah, he was a supply sider. Yeah, and he was a uh, fiscal conservative, but he was also a Cold War hawk and very tough on the Russians and, and so on. But the fact of the matter is the Kennedys and people associated with them at the Kennedy Library and so on fought back. They fought to preserve the original image that they and Kennedy himself had constructed. They were hypercritical of some of this revisionist literature. But in the long run, I I try to argue that whatever the historians had to say about Kennedy, pro or con, it didn't seem to matter much to the public in general, because in public opinion polls, generally, the view of Kennedy remained positive, and it's still basically very positive. Right. And that's, that's in part because the Kennedys promoted that. They promoted scholarship that looked at Kennedy in that particular way. They discouraged scholarship that took a more critical point of view. And they just simply devoted themselves to that particular image of brand. And they were largely successful. Yep. But I, I say successful not necessarily with historians. We, we now have a kind of blended view of Kennedy that certainly recognizes his many flaws, his illnesses, his romantic liaisons with Marilyn Monroe and others while he was in the White House. But at the same time, give him some kind of credit. I think one of the important things here is contemporary American politics and how it forces historians who work on Kennedy to read back some of the attributes of contemporary American politics, read it back into the Kennedy years. And to understand, for example, take comparison with Obama. Obama obviously confronted a very hostile Republican-dominated Congress and just could not marshal the votes to get a good deal of his program to. Well, now we look back on Kennedy and realize he confronted a Congress that was very conservative as well. Right. Conservative Democrats and conservative Republicans, he couldn't get his program through. I think there's uh, more of an effort these days among historians, post-revisionist historians, to kind of contextualize Kennedy, to put him back into the period in which he actually operated, and also to give him credit for getting anything done in the face of such strong opposition on the Hill, 
And third, to give him credit, and this is really key, I think, to the memory issue, give him credit for not what he did, but what he represented to the Americans, and that ties Kennedy back into the Kennedy brand again. Yeah, and charisma. He, yeah, he, well, he, let's face it, I remember having once uh, years and years and years ago a discussion with my mother, who wasn't a historian, but was an avid reader, and of course a Kennedy fan in the kitchen of her house about, and at that point I was really high on my revisionist period as a historian. Mm -hmm. So I had a pretty critical view of Kennedy, and that's how I lectured on Kennedy in my classes. And I was going through this with her, and she was pretty upset with me, I have to say. (laughs) She she said to me, well, you don't get it, you know, because the fact is we love that guy. He made us feel good about ourselves. We were hopeful, full of optimism. And we're confident our, that our government have had problems with our government. We could get things fixed and solved. And looking back on that conversation now, I realized she captured something there. She was she was right to some extent. He didn't solve all the problems he confronted. He didn't go as far as he would have wanted to. His legislative achievements in less than three years were modest, to say the least. He made huge mistakes, like in the Bay of Pigs, for example. Right. But he made us feel good. And I try to get at this in the last chapter of the book. I think one of the things that sustains Kennedy's memory these days, positive memory, is just what I call nostalgia. Mm -hmm. We've lost hope in the country to some extent. We've lost confidence in our government, in our our leadership. And we also look back on a day when we had that kind of hope and confidence and when Americans felt very good about themselves and where they were as a country and where they were going. And that that's the early 1960s, I think, mm. the last time we felt that way. Yeah, no, that raises an interesting question, because I think that makes sense to me that people look back, you know, to what seemed a happier, simpler, more optimistic, more trusting yeah. time period. And that's a natural thing. I think that's the way nostalgia in some cases works. But is there any downside to that in that given our current political state and state of all of our national affairs... Can we afford to be so nostalgic when we try to think about our national leaders and should we maybe shift our gaze a little bit and see what we see what we liked about Kennedy, but see other things as well in the past that can guide us into the future? Obviously, nostalgia is no uh, blueprint. It's no guide to the future. It's nostalgia. It is a backward glance. And yet, it's not impossible to hope that we can have leadership in the country that made us feel confident, that restored a sense of optimism in America and the American dream, you might say, that seems to have been diminished these days. So I think you can look nostalgically back to the 60s, identify the way people felt. And it's not as if they didn't record it. We had all these public opinion polls and letters, thousands and thousands of letters that people wrote at the time about their feelings in the wake of Kennedy's assassination. So we know how they felt, and they felt, by comparison with today, pretty good, Mm. pretty optimistic, and pretty confident. And there's nothing wrong with that, feeling that we have problems, but we can fix them. They're not the same problems, however, and you can't fix them with the same old solutions, that's for sure. So nostalgia is not a guide in that sense. But it's also not bad if it makes us feel that there's a better life ahead for us if we want to pursue it. And that's how Kennedy made people feel. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I guess nostalgia could be paralyzing in one sense, where you think, oh, only the good things... The good things are all in the past, yeah. and leadership is all in the past. But it could also be inspiring to say, you know, th- those were pretty tough times, pretty conflicted, dangerous times, and leadership that we admire emerged. And maybe in these tough times, you know, there's room for leadership to emerge, which involves not only leaders, but also people willing to be led in a certain way. So I guess that's the optimistic vision of the Kennedy legacy. Yeah, I would say that's putting it better than I did. <laughs> well, you can... <laughs> You can take that one on your on your uh, book tour if if you need to. <laughs> well, this has been just great, Michael Hogan. I really appreciate you taking the time and talking about your fascinating book. I think what makes it so interesting is it's just not another Kennedy book. It really takes a long look at a life that now is longer than his real life. Oh yeah, and how it, it has evolved and how it's also shaped our understanding of politics in general. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate your time. Michael J. Hogan is author of The Afterlife of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a biography. Just published by Cambridge University Press and available everywhere. Don't go anywhere, people. In the Past Lane, a podcast about history and why it matters. We'll be right back. 
If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. The JFK brand is stronger than ever. And nowhere is this more evident than at the museum dedicated to telling the story of the John F. Kennedy assassination. It's the sixth floor museum at Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas. I was recently in Dallas to give a talk and had some free time to check out the museum. I was impressed with the museum and its handling of, let's be honest, a difficult and easily exploitable topic. Well, for the most part, the museum avoided sensationalism and those many conspiracy theories. Instead, it focused on telling the story of the Kennedy era, the assassination and its impact on the nation, and the subsequent investigations into whether Lee Harvey Oswald alone killed JFK or acted as part of a larger conspiracy. The sixth floor museum was absolutely jammed with visitors. And when I left, there was a long line of people on the sidewalk out front, waiting to gain admission. Clearly, the American public continues to be drawn to John F. Kennedy. To get a sense of why, I spent some time walking around Dealey Plaza, asking people why they were there. I noticed one man taking a lot of photographs. Turned out, he wasn't a tourist, but rather a guy who for years has been photographing the tourists who visit the plaza. Hang on here, I just want to make sure it's... Yeah, it's working. Yeah, so I'm a, I have, I'm a historian. My name is Ed O'Donnell. I have a podcast called In the Past Lane. Mm-hmm. I'm real job as a college professor, but I do it in my spare time. And I travel a lot, so I always go to historic sites, and I talk to museum people, but I also talk to everyday people, like, you know, like what draws you... What draws you to, to this site today? So I'm going to say, ask you, if you don't mind, uh, who are you and why are you here at Dealey Plaza? Well, my name is Jeff. I'm a Dallas native. One of my first memories is a very small child, my grandmother and my mom ironing. And soap opera was interrupted as the world turns. And, you know, heard this the about news, this event, yeah, about the new, the JFK. Stuff. And photographer and uh, not for a living but as an avocation yeah. and um, this place just always has a very strange vibe mm. and I've been photographing it for years and oh really it's kind of a side project or uh, yeah. yeah it is one of those places where you just get a huge cross-section of, of people and a lot of international folks as well yes um, especially on uh, anniversary dates I mean they'll be from all over Europe and Asia yeah. it's uh, it's a little macabre it's a little strange yeah yeah, that's what I was kind of wondering, like, what... And so you come here quite frequently, so I guess you see the, the cross-section. Even over there in the corner, the conspiracy corner right. is over there, uh, with the selling conspiracy theory books. A lot um, of vendors kind of become friends with these guys, these little, you know, tour guides yeah. with their magazines. And... I also spoke with a couple named Greg and Laura, who had memories of John F. Kennedy and a sense of why he's still appealing to people in 2017. What brings you out to Dealey Plaza on a beautiful March day? I just met a guy who's from Dallas who takes comes here all the time and takes just pictures of what's going on and curious, like, what brings folks like you from? Like, where are you from? And Well, we're, we're from the Metroplex, but our family's visiting here from Wyoming. Yeah. And uh, our little grandnieces and nephews wanted to see where JFK, because they've been studying it in right. school. So that was on their to-do list when they came from Wyoming. So we're down here. That's right. so, you, so you've been here before? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We've been down here. Yeah, grew up around here. So, yeah. So we're here. It sounds good. And what do you think about, what do you think, like, your own impressions of JFK now, 50, his 100th birthday is coming up in just a few weeks. And, mm-hmm. you know, there are all these anniversaries. Do you think there's something about JFK that appeals to, the, to people in certain ways? Yes, there are. I mean, they always say that... Uh, you will remember special things, and I remember when he was assassinated, and was uh, my mom broke down crying and stuff whenever I was like five, something like that. And uh, I remember, the, I remember the day JFK was shot. So yeah, I think JFK was a great president. So 
Mm-hmm. And what do you, what are, when you say great president, what, like in, in what way? In contrast to succeeding presidents? Is it something about the era or about the youth and optimism that some people... I think it was the youth and optimism. It was this, the whole country just had a positive attitude. We were going forward, mm-hmm. and then it was bam, it was crushed. Uh, I think... I think there's a lot to learn, even for leaders today, to learn to look back on what our leaders of yesterday did whenever facing things, because there's similarities that they can learn from. One of the last people I spoke to was a street musician named Jay. He didn't want to talk to me on tape, but he was okay with me recording his beautiful rendition of Nearer My God to Thee. He performed this song on his violin in a small alcove at the large outdoor memorial to JFK that's right off of Dealey Plaza. I got the sense that it was his way of paying tribute somehow to the slain president. Maybe even his way of pushing back against all the tourism and commercialism that swirls around Dealey Plaza. Maybe it's his way of reminding us that when shots rang out in Dealey Plaza on November 22, 1963, they marked the abrupt end to a president's life, and in many ways, the end of an era. citizens we've reached the end of this episode of in the past lane thanks for listening let me know what you think of this episode and this podcast send your comments questions and suggestions along via twitter instagram and facebook please also leave a starred review even just a sentence or two at stitcher itunes or wherever you get your podcasts reviews are really helpful for attracting new listeners thanks if you want to learn more about this episode's topic you'll find it at our website, inthepastlane.com. There you'll find a show page that has recommended readings, links, and show credits. Thanks to all the terrific people who make In the Past Lane possible, including associate producer Devin McHugh and graphic designer Maggie Salucci. Thanks also to the Free Music Archive, which supplied most of the music for this episode. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, the people want to know. What's our next episode about? How should I know? SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 